people see a lot of our final work and they're like, oh, these are like designers. And it's like, no, not really. We're more of technologists. All of the stuff that we make is built using code. Uh, I have a really, I have a fond um, relationship with statistics. I love numbers, but I like turning those numbers in ways that, that um, makes them engaging <laughs> and interesting to work with. And sometimes that's just a matter of, of finding creative ways to do this. So this is like dad geologist, and then this is like mom cake decorator influence, you know? Um, this was a piece, and this is our, one of our early iterations of this data set that you're looking at. This is how we usually start with projects. If we don't have this, we can't do our work. If somebody does contact us and they're like, hey, we want a logo or we want, we, we just want you to comp up ideas for us, I'm always, my first thing is we need data. Without data, we can't do our work. Uh, and it happens all the time where people work with us and they're like, well, just show us ideas, like comp out some ideas, we'll give you data later or we'll give you a sample set or a dummy set or something. And always the way that we work in our process is data first. We can't do anything beyond that. We can't make stuff up. It looks like we do because we have all these colors and shapes and sizes, but we plot everything out. We actually go through and analyze the data to find the stories. Like what's important with this data? So what this data here is, is it's all earthquake data. And you can see there's states, there's uh, locations, there's identifiers, there's dates, magnitude levels. Um, there's all kinds of stuff with this. And we first plotted across the US. Um, I'm not even showing that piece. Uh, it just showed a lot of earthquakes in California. And this was like from 2.5 magnitude. Um, and the real focus of the story was, though, it was the state of Oklahoma to show how fracking is affecting that state. So this is one of our iterations that we went to later on in it where you can see 2004 earthquake data and 2014. One thing I'll notice too, and disclosure of your data is always important. I would say some of the sensors got a lot more sensitive by this time too, the technology has evolved. But there's, despite that, there's still a very clear difference between the number of earthquakes that happen between these two. The final piece, though, like it, it was going to be two pages, and then it got down to one. When you go into this, it's, uh, there, we use a lot of black backgrounds, too, because you can really make colors vibrant, especially on print. It's kind of fun. Uh, magazines kind of hate us for that, because it's a lot of ink. So it's not the most eco-friendly way, and, but I won't get there right now. Uh, happy to talk about it later. But here's what we did, though. So this is our scale. This is 3.0 to 5.0 magnitude levels. So we trimmed the data down to focus on that. 3.0 started blue, and it, we use these kind of propeller wings. And then as you go up, the propeller turns. And then the color changes as well. There's, it's totally OK to use redundancy in information visualization. And we do it all the time. Text size, color, rotation, shape morphing, something like that. And so what that helps us do here is once you're in Oklahoma, you can see the areas of the higher magnitude versus the areas of the lower magnitudes very quickly with that. Um, have we ever used propeller wings in our visuals? No. Like this is kind of the part where we get to be the, this is what people pay us for, to be creative and think of something out of the box. And this ends up in a scientific journal or a magazine, which is pretty cool. And then we get these emails from scientists of like, they're all excited, like, oh, I want to do this too. Um, we also do things like this. This is not our piece, but this was from Popular Science Magazine, where they're like, hey, uh, we have this really expert Excel programmer guy, and this is what he did for us. Can you help us? And so we look at this, and I'm like, OK, there's, you know, here's one axis. It looks like it's on a log scale because of how it's growing. Uh, I'm not quite sure what this is, so we ask some questions. And these are a bunch of countries that nobody can really read. Right? And what he was trying to do was like the size of these circles is reflective of population. Anyway, we redesigned this. So we still had that raw data set. We saw what he did, and that actually helps us. And if we're working with magazines who typically have zero budgets, or very tiny ones, um, having the data set and knowing the story and the goal, that's half the work. And so what we get to do is apply our uh, knowledge and communication design. And how do you communicate things? And that's just as important of knowing what typography is, what colors do, 
when people look at them, how colors look next to one another. So we, we cleaned it up. And this is still the exact same chart with the exact same information. But one is not very legible. Like, this, come on. Like, there's no way you can read this stuff. And then the one that we did, and this was a full spread, was, oh, OK, now I can actually see what's going on here. The labels are here. There's information for text. Making it clear that this is a log scale, because you can see how these get narrower and narrower. Log scale is a really important thing in a lot of statistics and, and anyone here playing with data and all that. Just to understand the scale between things is really important. And in color, which ones are growing versus not? Um, instead of using those dot sizes, we use the text size. So you can see the biggest countries. You can see the biggest innovators up there. And in grouping these sort of areas of big innovators, not big changers, and then not like low innovators down here. This is another one. This is um, a timestamp. This is 1895 in August. We had uh, a data set that went all the way back to 1895, and we were using the, I believe it was the PDSI um, value. This is atmospheric moisture levels in California from 1895 until 2014 for every uh, region of California. California has seven distinct regions. We had mo every month of data worth of this. And so we were doing a piece on the drought in California. This was about three years ago. And so we took all the data, and we first plotted it in this. And I believe that we used Tableau for this. This is plotting every line. And at the beginning, if, when you work with data, you're like, oh, I can totally see this, this here, this kind of dipping down. Um, is there a story there to try to tell? And so we started, this is kind of where we were going with this, of like, oh, there's a trend analysis. Um, you can see here uh, uh, the gray and the orange. It's cut off over there. But one is PDSI and one is PHDI. They're two different values. And you can see they're pretty much the same. So then we, we get to pick one. And this is your exploration, like, what's the right element to attribute to show in this? And then we comped it out. We said, hey, this is what it'll look like. And we've been working with Scientific American for, I'd say, eight or nine years. Um, and Jen Christensen got back to us and was like, yeah, this is not, I'm not feeling this at all. Like, everyone knows this is happening. Um, so that there's a trend. Uh, this isn't really what we paid you to do. And they didn't pay as much. But I was like, all right, <laughs> let's go back then. And it's, it's good because our relationships to our clients also require we challenge each other. And that's great. Like We don't just come there with an ego on the table and like, this is what you're going to get. Take it or leave it. Um, we, we like to show this to clients. And it, when they have that innate understanding of the data, it, it's really exciting for us because we're not intimate with that data. We didn't write those stories. We didn't collect that data. We're the communicators. And so it really helps when we have clients who push us. So I went back to the data set. I plotted out every single month from 1895, and I used a moving average. So that's that curve of a line. So instead of just like a linear trend line, now it's moving. Um, and now I broke it out even more to get it really granular. Seven different regions. Each color represents a region for a month and a time. And then all these lines here we map out. And so my question back to them was, OK, this is all of this information. What's considered a threshold? What's abnormally high and abnormally low? And they said, well, four. OK, great. So what we did was we, at the four markers, we kind of faded everything in, bet under, in between that four. We faded all that back. It's still visible. But now anytime something goes outside of that normality, highlight it somehow, which is draw a line that goes from that to the middle. And now you have this sort of barcode effect that's going on here. And so now this is a totally new story. Instead of saying, like, yeah, we're, you know, we're getting drier or whatever over time, now what we're actually seeing is, no, 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 it's getting more volatile over time. We're getting wetter seasons than ever before and drier seasons than ever before. And we just saw these last two or three years, we've ha now had the wettest seasons and since you know, whenever. Uh, unusually wet, and then what's going to happen after that is we'll have another drought. It's predictable now. What we're actually doing with this piece is um, 
we're going to digitize this so there's a live version of it. And every month we'll update the data. And it's just our own personal, like for us, that we're going to do. Because we have the concept and everything else. Sometimes, though, with your work, it's not about making visuals uh, immediately understandable. And don't ever get caught into that trap, because people will tell you, like, I don't really understand this. And sometimes I'm like, well, you have to read it. You know, you don't give somebody war and peace and just say, you just got to understand it. You know, like you, you do, there are certain things you need to understand when you're looking at it in order to grasp that. It's not a shopping cart for Amazon of like the don't make me think. So we'll do like annotations and we'll actually draw a text that goes to different points here. Sort of a last note that we do though in the studio with this is we have this thing in our board that we call the challenge. Um, and somebody in the team has decided, or they decide what they want to talk about. And this was Oakland City Census data. Um, and then as a team, we have a few weeks or however much time we have to visualize this data in whatever way we want. There's no um, correcting people. There's no suggestions. It's just people sharing their ideas and kind of being vulnerable. It, allow, it kind of works your creative muscles in a way. And so um, some of these were showing like what kind of jobs were in Oakland from 1940 to 50 to 60 and how they changed, like administrative service, industrial, professional. Um, some of them were uh, racial. I think I had one up there that was kind of cut off, but it was showing the racial diversity of Oakland because it's really changed. If you go back to like 1908 uh, when the earthquake happened in San Francisco, you had all these rich white people come over and build all these big buildings in downtown Oakland. And then once you started hitting the 40s and 50s, you had white flight, uh, after all those people were going back to San Francisco, leaving an African American population there that was neglected in many regards. And, um, and then the crack e epidemic, Black Panthers, Malcolm X, like all this stuff that really uh, shaped Oakland's history with that. And it's, it's, it's pretty cool stuff when you look at it. But we're all doing like these different techniques. Mine was supposed to look like a California lily. You know, it's like it didn't matter wasn't supposed to be right or wrong. It's just like, I'm playing with this idea. What do you think? And, and you know, we'll kind of share that and be like, yeah, that's pretty cool, you know, or we won't say anything. <laughs> um, but I think that's just an important element to, to note. Most of our tools are um, technology based. I, we do use Illustrator a lot. Um, and we'll use Illustrator for like concepting purposes, like just sketching stuff out. Um, and you know ideas of like what we're doing, or when we have the data and we sort of know the stories, we kind of use Illustrator either at the very beginning or at the very end. Typically at the very end because we got to prep it for print. So it's CMYK. There's all these different things there. But while we're analyzing Tableau is a big one. Uh, we use a lot of web tools like D3, uh, a lot of custom JavaScript. React is a big tool we do right now um, because it's a React is sort of a Facebook binding tool. If you're not a coder, I don't recommend learning React because it's going to change by the time you get really comfortable with it. That's what technology does. Um, the other thing I always tell people is if you're not a programmer, you can do a couple of things. Like If you're like, hey, I'd really like to learn how to code. Um, there is a, a tool that I always recommend to people. It's an open source uh, prototyping tool called Processing. It was uh, developed by um, two friends, acquaintances of mine from MIT years ago. And it was built mostly using Java at the time. And today it still does, but you, it has its own language system. And it also, there's, uh, there are other ways to write it in different languages. But what Processing is, is it's like a, it's a prototyping tool slash development environment slash programming language slash community. And so there's this whole community in here. It's totally free, and you can hook it up to hardware systems. Um, there, it, because it's open source, there's all these plugins for it. You want to do like 3D stuff on, on WebGL, you can totally do that. Um, there's a lot of tutorials for it. There's ways of like playing with it. The thing about processing that's great is um, it, has, it does not have a super steep learning curve if you're not familiar with code. And it's, it, you can pull in any kind of data to it. So um, Excel data, output it as a CSV file, pull it into processing. 
And then with each value, um, draw a shape and a color based on that value on your screen. You, like I've done processing workshops in Stanford and stuff just to show people like how easy it is to work with us. It's one I recommend also because it's inspiring. Like the works that you see people have here, there should be like an exhibition. If you kind of just see the stuff people do, it's kind of all over the place. Behavioral complexity, random access memory, like I've seen movie uh, trailers use processing to do animation sequences before it, because you can output an MOV file as well. It's really cool. You can also output stuff as like, some of our older work we would do using processing. We would output it as an SVG, and then we pulled in an illustrator. We might um, dial in the typeface and the type treatment, and then it's ready for print. So it's a nice tool, basically, in a very long-winded way. Um, D3 is also a really great tool um, because there are so many tutorials out there. And what we do with D3 is we'll customize it. Um, but most of our stuff is like, um, it's web-based. We're subjective. I mean, this is kind of a note about data and selecting your data is um, we are humans. And I think that's something very important to understand. Everyone's talking about being objective. And I think it's, it's not so much of being objective as much as being transparent. You have to make decisions in your data, uh, whether it's a color decision or what you're selecting for your data set. Maybe it's more accurate, but still, you just made a decision. And when we humans make decisions, um, I, I, I'm, I would argue that there's a lot more subjectivity in those decisions than there's objectivity because we're humans. Like we're conditioned already to make these decisions. I like black backgrounds, you know? Uh, <laughs> and I'll go through phases where I only wear black, you know, and it's, I feel comfortable and that's just kind of my thing. Um, don't, doesn't show coffee stains. But, um, you know, it's, I think it's just important to realize that.